Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter. And this is the blessed life, part number one. The blessed life, part number one. God knows that people want to be blessed. Anybody in this place say, I want to be blessed in my life. Okay? Now, if you don't want to be blessed, why don't you just hand your blessings over to me because I really want to be blessed. Because in our life, I mean, it's evident everywhere you look, people want to live a blessed life. In fact, the world would call it mere happiness, you know, and in our nation, we enjoy the freedoms that we have for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People are pursuing blessings in their life. They're looking for happiness. John Wesley said this, he said, Though all men desire, yet few attain happiness, because they seek it where it is not to be found. See, oftentimes when you look around in the world, you see people that are seeking happiness in relationships, happiness in men and women, happiness in money, happiness in fortune and fame, happiness in activities and happiness in all these things. And yet when Jesus showed up on the scene, And when Jesus started to do his earthly ministry and people started finding out about Jesus and hearing that people were getting blessed, they thronged to Jesus. They came to Jesus. In fact, this is the scene that we find in Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting in verse number one. Many times when you read about the Beatitudes, you read about them and you start in verse number three. But I want to start in verse number one because Jesus is going about, he's preaching the kingdom of God, people are getting healed, there's so much activity around Jesus, that people are thronging him. There there are multitudes coming to him, and the Bible says that they were trying to just touch him because as they touched him, power went out from him, and he healed them all. So here Jesus is in the midst of the multitudes, and look at what happens in Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting in verse number one. It says, in seeing the multitudes, he, speaking of Jesus, went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, look at this, his disciples came to him. So here Jesus goes up to a mountain and Jesus sits down. And that was the form of teaching that the rabbis of that day did. They would go and they would sit. That's why you find the Moses seat in the synagogue because those who were teaching would sit on that seat and they would teach the people. So Jesus takes true form of a teacher here and Jesus goes up on a mountain and he sits and then the Bible says his disciples came to him. Not just the 12 because if you read through the Sermon on the Mount, you'll find out at at the end of it, it doesn't say and the 12, it says and the people were amazed at his teaching. So there is more than just the 12 here, but there's not the multitudes that were thronging him just to get healing or just to get a blessing. There are people that are surrounding him. His disciples come to him. See, that's why we are here in church tonight. It's because we are seeking a blessing. We are seeking Jesus. We want to see his face. We want to hear his voice. We want to find his heart. We want to live in his will and his way. We want his grace and his favor on our life. And that's what we're doing. See, his disciples will come to him. Jesus' people will come after him. See, you you may have unusual miracles and things that take place out in the world, and you'll find crowds of people thronging that place. There are revival centers. You wonder why, after a while, that revival goes away. Here's why. Because Jesus' disciples, when Jesus moves, they're going to move with him. Wherever Jesus is going, they're going. But if Jesus doesn't go, they say, like Moses, unless your presence goes, I'm not going with you. I'm not going without you, I mean. And so here we find that the disciples of Jesus, the people that were really wanting to be a follower of Christ. Here they are, coming after him. Verse number two, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse number three, blessed, everybody say blessed. Blessed. See, we're talking about a blessed life. And now here Jesus is, and he says, these kinds of people are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, When they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. 
For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now we're going to stop right there because he continues on in his sermon, but we're going to take a look at just the blessings. Uh, Oftentimes you'll find these as the beatitudes. Beati meaning blessing or happiness if you find it in the Latin. But in the original language, in the original term, talking about the blessing. And this is the type of people that we ought to be. We ought to be a blessed people. See, here he describes what a true blessing is. If you take a look at this, that's a real blessing. The rewards that he lists are a real blessing. But I want you to notice something. It's not based on circumstances. Because if the blessing was based on circumstances, the people that Jesus lists are not blessed. Is that true? Because we think blessing is wealth, riches, abundance. And the very first thing Jesus says is blessed are the poor. Wait a second. That just, that, that's not blessing. That's a curse. That's, that's not true happiness, lack and need and want. So that should show us this is not a circumstantial thing. This is also not a natural thing. Jesus is not saying that this is a natural state, even though some of them, they do run over into the natural, like persecutions. But what he's saying is that there is a, a, a being, there is a state, there is a way that a person is that blesses them. Let me say it to you like this. Talking about circumstances versus being. See, it's quite, quite contrary in our thinking to what a real blessing is. James Smith said this, he said, happiness is found not in what we have, but in what we are. Let me say that again. Happiness is found not in what we have, but in what we are. If we are in Christ, then we're going to have the happiness. We're going to have the blessings of life. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So it's not about what we have, but it's in what we are. If we are a Christian, then we are blessed. And that's the type of life Jesus wants us to live. I love the way the Spirit-filled Life Bible defines the word blessed because it, it says it this way. It says, happy, supremely blessed, a condition in which congratulations are in order. That just made me smile when I read that. Because you think about it, somebody that's blessed, you want to go and, and share in the blessing, right? You hear somebody got a new car and you, what do you want to do? Hey, congrats, man. That's, that's what a blessing that is. Somebody got married and you just want to write them a note and may God just bless your marriage, right? You, there's congratulations in order when someone is blessed. See, as, as the church of Almighty God, when we walk in the door, we could rightly say to every person that's born of the Spirit of God walking in, congratulations. God is on the throne today. But you know what? You're so blessed to be a Christian. You're blessed to be alive. There's one guy that used to meet me at the back door. I'd say, hey, bud, how you doing? He'd say, every day above ground is a good one. (laughs) Now, I get what he's saying, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm above ground or if this body goes below ground because then, my goodness, the blessings really start because I get to see Jesus face to face. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. I'm going to glory. Don't cry for me. Throw a party in my honor and congratulate me for graduating. See, that's what this is all about. God is good. It's funny because uh, I was thinking about this, this, this state of being blessed, this state of being happy, not being based on circumstances. And, and, a, and a cute little story came to mind. I don't know if, uh, if, if the parents of the individual I'm about ready to talk about are here tonight, but if they are, they'll, they'll be smiling and laughing at themselves. But I was dropping my son off at, at our school. We have a, a preschool here and we have a, a Christian school here. And so my, my little guy, he's in preschool. And so um, I was dropping him off. And as I was dropping him off, I noticed that uh, one of his little friends from church class. Now, there is a difference. You know, we got church classes that you drop them off to. And then when you drop them off for preschool, they have their preschool class. So here I am dropping him off at preschool class. And I saw one of the kids from church that had not been at the preschool yet there at the playground. Little girl, cute as a button. And and she's sitting there just sniffing. (laughs) Well, she knows who I am. So she looked at me and she sees me. And she all of a sudden she realizes, I know this guy and I have an ally on the outside. And so she says, I want my mommy. Nap is different. And I went, 
nap is different. Oh, okay, you don't like it here, you know, and I realized she's basically asking me, will you break me out and take me to mommy, you know, and I, and I got down on her level. I said, oh, honey, listen, it's going to be okay. You're going to have so much fun. Look at my little guys here, and you guys can play and, and have a good time, and that, that sort of was okay, but she kind of looked at me like, you, you betrayed me, and how could you, you know, and so she ran off, and, and, and they played. Well, uh, about a week later, here I was once again, dropping my little guy off, and I see her, and she is skipping around the playground, right? She is skipping around the same playground, same little girl, right? And as she comes whizzing by, she does this. She goes, I want my mommy. <laughs> Nap is different. And, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, what is that all about? <laughs> Here's what happened. The circumstance didn't change. The need in her life didn't change, but what happened? She changed. See, as you get into the word, or, or I should better say, as the word gets into you, your circumstances on the outside may not change. You're still going to wake up in the same earth suit. You're, you're still going to be in the same neighborhood, in the same house, looking in the same mirror, brushing the same teeth, wearing the same clothes. But you know what? On the inside now, all of a sudden, something's changed. You're different. You're blessed. And now you have the capacity to succeed. I remember when I gave my heart to the Lord, 15 years old, uh, I, I was raised in church. Parents growing up were Christians. Thought that I was a Christian because I went to church, read the Bible, prayed, had answered prayers in life. Thought that I was a Christian, and yet something was missing on the inside of me. Something was lacking. And I remember my brother came home from a missions trip, and as he came home, he shared the gospel with me with a little gospel tract. And that night, in the middle of the night, I woke up miserable, but the Spirit of God was hovering over me, and, and I was kind of like, what is this all about? And I reached into my pocket and found that gospel tract, and there I prayed to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And you know what? Same kid, same 15-year-old, same house, same family, same, uh, same air, same water, same everything, but for some reason, when I woke up the next morning shaved, all of a sudden, everything changed. All of a sudden, the air just seemed to be sparkling uh, a little bit bit cleaner. Even the smog looked better. Uh, the birds were chirping. The rays of sun were coming through the window. And I remember saying, my goodness, something is different. Here's what's different is I am now blessed. I am no longer cursed. I'm a child of God and I have the blessing of God on my life. That's what makes all the difference. So here Jesus comes and he says we're blessed. How to live the blessed life. He gives it to us. He tells us how to live the blessed life. If you are blessed, then you need to know how to use these blessings in your life. We're going to go through two. Every time we're together in this series, we'll do two of these, okay? So tonight, we're going to do, go through two of these blessings, two of these be attitudes, the attitudes we ought to be. Come on, somebody. Look at you never say, you ought to be. How to live the blessed life. This is how we ought to be, the be attitudes. Number one, is empty yourself. Now, notice on the overheads, I capitalized the word self, okay? Uh, you know, if we had a storehouse of blessings, we would go to our shelf and empty it of self. Got it? Because Jesus said these words in the third verse, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. To be congratulated Somebody who is happy, somebody who is supremely blessed, somebody who, who, who we should go and we should congratulate is somebody who has emptied themselves. They are now poor in spirit. Now we look at that and we say, well, poor in spirit, what does that mean? What is, what is that all about? Ah, glad you asked. Turn to me to the book of Revelation. Revelation, the third chapter, okay? Towards the end of the Bible, if you hit the maps, turn around and come back one book. Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking. He's writing letters to churches and he's talking to a church. Revelation, the third chapter. We're going to take a look at two verses, verse number 17 and verse number 18. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Revelation chapter 3, verse number 17 starts out and says, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, 
poor, blind, and naked. Now, that right there is just a scathing rebuke from the Lord. I mean, think about it. If Jesus showed up at your doorstep, you opened the door and you said, Jesus. And he said, you don't know. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You would be destroyed. I would be destroyed. I'd be sobbing and crying there at his feet, you know, just, oh my goodness, I was so deceived. I didn't realize what was going on. He says, in the natural, when you say that I'm rich, I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing. What is that? That's us elevating ourselves, elevating our pride. Now all of a sudden we're in opposition to the Lord because God opposes the proud. So we have to empty ourselves of ourselves. We have to be spiritually Poor. What does that mean? Poor meaning the lowest level, that we are beggars. We have nothing on our own. We are not rich. We are poor. We haven't become wealthy. We, we've got nothing, and we have need of... No, no, we have need of everything. I cannot even store up enough air to keep myself alive for a couple minutes. I can't change the color of my hair. I can't make myself grow an inch. I cannot feed off myself. See, uh, you stop eating food and drinking water, you're gone. You're gone. It will only be so long unless the Lord intervenes. None of us can save ourselves. None of us can make it to heaven on our own. None of us can do the things that God wants us to do without the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. So there has to be a spiritual need and a spiritual want. Let's take a look at verse number 18. Verse number 18 comes along and says this, I counsel you. So Jesus said, here's what you need to do. Because you said this and you don't realize that your state is really poverty, I counsel you, listen to me, listen up, here's what I want you to do. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed. The rest of the verse says that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may See, see, we're groping about in darkness without the illumination of the Lord. We're, we're, we're spotted, we're stained, we're dirty without the clothing of the Lord. And we don't have any wealth. All of our gold is tinsel that we took off the Christmas tree from last year unless we go to Jesus and buy from him gold. Now you say, well, wait a second. If I'm poor and needy and destitute and all that stuff, how can I buy from Jesus all these things. Ah, I'm glad you asked. Let me put it up on the overheads for you in the book of Isaiah. Great verse, uh, a really a, a corresponding verse to what we just read. Isaiah, the 55th chapter, verse 1 and 2. Look at what it says up on the overheads. It says, Ho! Listen up! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. If you have a need, if you have a desire, if you have a lack or a want, you have a thirst, then, then come. Come to the waters. What are you doing? You are acknowledging, I have a need, I have a lack, I have something in my life that, that, that I can't fulfill, but you know what? I'll come. I'll humble myself and do it your way, God, and I will be filled. Look at this. Come to the waters and you who have no money. Do you know people who have no money are called what? Poor, right? So you who have no money, come buy and eat. Look at this. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. In other words, as you humble yourself and you give your broken, destitute, impoverished life to the Lord, God says, I will give you everything you have need of. If you come to me, child, and you're thirsty, I'll give you drink. If you come to me needy, yeah, wine and milk, I'll take care of you. Get what you need without money and without price. Look at verse number two. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? In other words, why are you going around wasting time and effort on worldly wealth, worldly pursuits, elevating yourself, prideful thinking? Why are you spending time on that? And your wages for what does not satisfy why are you going around trying to entertain yourself and numb yourself when you have a need? Don't go and numb yourself and try and entertain yourself or, or, or just ignore the problem. No, bring it to me. Humble yourself. Realize that you're poor and needy and you can't do it on your own. You need to come and drink. Come and I will give it to you. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself. In abundance. See, as you listen to the voice of the Lord, 
You realize the true wealth of the kingdom of God. You realize, my goodness, this worldly stuff, this worldly wealth has nothing. Why? It's temporary. It's fleeting. It lasts for a moment. Even the Bible says riches will grow wings and fly away. Anybody else experienced you had an abundance and all of a sudden it grew wings and it flew away? Anybody notice that about money? You know, you get a big, oh, I got my tax return. And now here we are a couple months later and saying, Where's it? When's, when's next year coming around? Because I need that tax return again. Anybody experience that other than Pastor Dan? Okay, two of you. Great. Praise the Lord. But see, that's how life is. And so God is saying, don't invest yourself in temporary things that are not going to satisfy you here on the earth. Don't go after things that are not going to solve problems in your life. Numbing yourself, ignoring the problem isn't going to work. It's going to fester and it's going to boil up and it's going to eventually explode in your face. You don't want that. Come to me. I'll take care of you. I'll clothe you. I'll feed you. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. I've got your back. Are you listening tonight? Thomas Watson said, Till we're poor in spirit, Christ is never precious. And before we see our own wants, we never see Christ's worth. See, it's as we realize that, you know what? I don't got anything. I am not all that and a bag of chips. Just me. I'm poor and needy. God, I need you. God, I need you to come through. God, I need you to save me. God, I need you to heal me. God, I need you to deliver me. God, I need you to provide. God, I need you to give me strength for this day. God, I need you to take care of this situation. God, I, I give you my relationships. God, I, I give you my marriage. God, I give you my children. God, I can't do it. God, I need your grace. I need your ability. I need your power. I need your strength. God, I need you. See, when you say that and you recognize and realize you're poor in spirit, now God says, Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, maybe you don't realize what that means, and, and you may not be given a clap, or maybe you are, but you're going, I don't understand what that means. See, Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it is my good pleasure, my Father's good pleasure, to give you the kingdom. He didn't say to give you gold bricks. Hello? He didn't say to give you an army. He didn't say to give you a house on the wall of the castle. He said it is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you realize what the kingdom encompasses? The kingdom encompasses all that is within the kingdom. That means the entire economy. That means the agriculture. That means the resources. That means the wealth. That means the, the facility. That means the king himself. Why? Because there is no kingdom without a king. The king himself is now given to you. You have Christ on the inside of you. And now you have the kingdom of God. Jesus said the kingdom has come near to you even in your hearts. You have everything you need. Why? Because the kingdom is right there. And any time you have need in life, because you are poor in spirit, now yours is the kingdom of heaven. The book of James, let's take a look at it. You want to turn there with me in the book of Revelation, turn a couple books back to the book of James chapter 2. Right after the book of Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. And in James chapter 2, here James is saying, why are you giving rich people preferential treatment in church? Stop that. God has no respect of persons. He doesn't care what you make here on earth. That's not what this is about. James chapter 2, verse number 5, look at what he says. He says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Church, I've got good news for you tonight. Doesn't matter your social, your economic status here on the earth. Doesn't matter what background you came out of, what family you might have been raised in, what side of the tracks you may have been born on. Hello, come on somebody. Or what side of the freeway, you know. Hey, that, that, that doesn't matter. Doesn't matter rich kid, poor kid, rich dad, poor dad. Doesn't matter any of that kind of stuff. All of that is nothing. Why? Because you may be poor here in the natural here and now. But listen, if you are poor in spirit and you realize and recognize, you know, whether you've got millions in the bank or nothing in the bank, does not matter. Why? Because I have the kingdom of God at my disposal and God has got me under his control, under his care, and I have everything that I have need of as I call upon the kingdom resource from God. See, that's the blessing 
of being poor in spirit is that as you realize it's not about me, this is about the kingdom of God. It's not about my will, it's about his will. It's not about my greatness, it's about his greatness. Then, by faith, you get a hold of the things that you have need of in life, and you bring them into your reality here on the earth. You confess the word of God, you believe the word of God, and then you receive the word of God. Are you listening tonight? Hallelujah. Second thing for tonight, I'm going to do two of these, remember. Second one for tonight is this. Deeply care. You want to live a blessed life? Deeply care. Jesus said it like this. Let's go back to the book of Matthew in the fifth chapter. Turn back there with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter number five. Verse number four, look at what he says. He says, blessed, everybody say blessed. Blessed are those who mourn. Look at this, for they shall be comforted. Now this word mourn in the original language is the strongest word that you can find that they used for mourning. In other words, uh, this was the word that would be used if somebody had a close relative or association that died, somebody that they loved deeply passed away. And in their day and age, they would hire professional mourners, right, that would come and weep and wail at the gravesite and that sort of a thing. But it was quite different, the professional mourners and the person that lost a loved one. Are you listening? That's the type of mourning that he's talking about, is somebody who had somebody in their life that they deeply loved, and now they have lost, and now they are weeping, they are crying, and they are mourning. Again, we look at that and we say, how is that blessed, Jesus? That's not a blessing. I mean, that's a loss in life. That, that, that makes no sense. What are you doing, Jesus? And yet, realize the wisdom of God is not our wisdom. The way of God is higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And now, we've got to press in and tap in. What, what is it, Jesus? What is it, Spirit of God, that you would have us to see? How is this a blessing in our life? Uh, I like what Do Dr. Uh, Myron Os Augsburger writes, and he writes, to mourn is to care deeply. To know godly sorrow for sin, to be deeply concerned about evil in the world, and to know the meaning of suffering because of the sin, injustice, and perversion in society. That's what Jesus means when he says that blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Now, mourning can take many different forms. Mourning can be crying. Mourning can be that emotion that's, that's overwhelming, that, that you just kind of lose your breath. Mourning can be where, where you can't get the care and, 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 and the concern out of your mind. See, mourning takes many different forms. And, and, and I wonder, church, how our lives would be different if we mourned over things in our life. See, because if you care deeply about something, then it's going to move you. Is that right? See, when, when, when something's going on in here that you care deeply about, it's not just going to stay in here, it's going to drop in here. Are you listening? It goes from your head down to your heart. And when something is in your heart, the Bible says out of the heart proceeds everything that happens in our life. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And therefore, if we deeply care and carry the concern and the burden of things, we mourn over things, then it's going to move into our everyday lives and actions. So what does that look like in our lives? I remember the first time I ever realized what my sin did to Jesus on the cross was outside of a church in Chula Vista, California. I could show you the bench where I was reading the account. And here was Jesus on the cross. Here was the horrific suffering. Here was everything that was going on in his life. Here was two thieves next to him reviling him and, and, and speaking evil against him. Here's all the religious leaders uh, spitting on him and, and saying evil against him. Here's all of his disciples scattered from him. And there Jesus is alone on the cross. And, and one of the guys on the cross next to him, one of the thieves, looks at him and, and realizes and repents and says, Hey, wait a second, wait a second, hold on, hold, hold the phone for a moment. Well, we were justly punished, but this guy hasn't done anything. Look around. What's he done? They haven't brought a real accusation yet. And he looks to the Lord, and he says, Remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus looks back at him and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. I remember at that very moment, I got a picture of myself as that thief on the cross looking to Jesus for salvation, and I literally wept over my sin. Changed my entire life. 
Church, what would our lives be like if every day we mourned over our sin? If when we encountered sin in our life and when we recognized and realized something's gone on in our heart, that we actually cared deeply about it. See, we have been so numbed to, to sin. We've been desensitized. And now we are insensitive to the things that grieve the Spirit of God. And God is crying out and saying, don't you realize the relationship that you have with me? Don't you realize that that hurts my heart and I can't remain close to that? I'm still in your heart. You're still a Christian. But listen, the power and the intimacy in your life is going to be gone if you continue in that. And if we cared deeply about it, it would move us to do something about it. Now listen, I'm not just preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself right now too. Because I can find it easy to be insensitive, not only to my own self, but to the needs of others. Just, just the other day, my wife and I were going on a date, and, and I, I was looking at movies to go to, and one of them looked really interesting, had a great story, great plot, it looked like it was intriguing, you know, kind of sci-fi thriller type thing. And, and I got savvy, and I got a hold of this little app that gave Christian reviews of movies, because I said, well, they're going to tell me every word that's bad that's spoken, every bit of nudity and filth, you know, they're going to tell me all that stuff so that I know before going into this movie what I'm getting myself into. And as I started reading the Christian review, it grieves me. And I said, ain't no way I'm going, let alone take my wife to see that. And so we ended up seeing else that was completely disappointing. You know, and that was just, it was just Hollywood, okay? But anyways, it was actually better, though, than going to see the other one. See, if we actually cared, if we took the time to realize and to take a, a step back from ourselves and mourn and grieve and weep and wail over our sin, I believe we would live holier lives. Don't you? What about in our society? What about in our world? What about with people that are in our spheres of influence? Listen, grandparents, can I talk to you for a second? Don't, don't, don't back off your grandchildren. Love them. Train them. Teach them. Your kids may, may not like everything that you have to say, but they're ultimately the parent. They're going to raise them. But you have influence, and if you deeply care... Blessed are those who mourn. See, move to do something. Talk to your children. Show them the right way of the Lord. See, uh, with, with, with your, your, your children. Speak to them. Care about them enough to not let them get away with stuff. My kids just went to camp. They are tired. They're probably asleep in those chairs over there right now. But listen, I, I told my daughter, because my daughter said, Daddy, I'm feeling like I don't want to be here. I'm so tired. I said, Honey, I know you're tired, but just tap into Jesus right now. Because the mountaintop is great, but church is what's ongoing, and that's what's going to get you into the teaching of the Word of God. It's consistent in your life. And just push through, honey. You're going to make it, and you can sleep in tomorrow. See, we've got to place these values. You say, You're tough on your kids. My goodness, they're going to grow up and hate the house of God. No, they're not. They're going to love the house of God. Here's the reason why, because tonight I know my children are having a God encounter over there. And listen, I trust God with my kids more than I trust myself. Is that right? And because I care about them and love them, I'm going to do the hard things with them. I'm going to tell them, no, you can't watch that movie. You can't hang out with those friends. I'm sorry, we're not going to go and do that. It's just not right. We're going to stay away from that area. That's not how we live our lives. Listen, I know you want to have that video game, but that video game has things in it that are bad that I don't think are going to be good for your spirit. See, if you care, if you can mourn, if you can trust God and move that from here into here and cry out over it and then do something about it, it's going to change the world that we live in. How about for our world? See, if we can look at our world and say, wait, how many women were taken and are just missing? We need to be grieved by this stuff. I'm sorry. God's people are being abused. Churches are being burned. They're making them take marks on their door. I mean, what, have we gone back to Hitler's area? What is going on here? See, and yet, we watch the news and we go, hmm, wonder what else is on. 
And yet we need to grieve and we need to mourn and we need to be just completely shocked out of our systems and not be desensitized. Listen, that's not a video game. It's not a first person shooter. There are actual lives that are being taken on this earth and we need to be grieved and mourn enough to get on our knees before the Father and say, God, I can't do anything about it. I'm thousands of miles away, but God, you can do something about it. And God, you've got people there and God, bless your people, protect your people, Strengthen them. God, move. Lord, let the gospel pierce these places in Jesus' name. The Bible says that when you do that, you're blessed. You're blessed. You are blessed when you mourn. Quite contrary to what we think on the outside. But really, when you take a look at the being, now you are blessed. Why? Because what does it say the rest of the verse? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They shall be be comforted. Yeah, you may be uncomfortable now, but you shall be comforted. The Bible says at the end of it all, when everything wraps up, that God himself will come and wipe every tear from our eyes. I can't imagine a better comforter than God himself. Psalm 34, 18 says this, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. There in your bedroom, when you're crying all alone and you thought nobody was listening, The Bible says that God takes every tear and places it in a vial. He's got it stored up. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. When you were there at work and you ran into the bathroom because you didn't want anybody to see you break down, God was there. When you were in the car on the freeway and you were just about ready to drive off the road and crash the car because you wanted to end it all, listen, God was there in the passenger seat keeping you safe. Listen, you might be wondering, my goodness, I've been mourning, I've been... Listen, you will be comforted. The reward for our care is a God who is near and who comforts. God cares about your life. Plain and simple. Last verse for tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Great verse. I want you to turn there and find it in your Bible because you need to get back to these spots. And actually, the, the whole first chapter of 2 Corinthians, if you're grieving, you're going through a hard time, I would encourage you just to, just to meditate on all these verses surrounding what we're about ready to read. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, but I want to just take a look at one verse, verse number 5. Look at this. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. See, Jesus was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. The Bible records that Jesus wept when he saw the suffering of others. He he cried, and he cried out. He had pain, and he had sorrow. He wept, and he wailed before Almighty God. And just as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, when you became a Christian, you got the Spirit of Christ on the inside of you. That means that you are now acquainted with sorrows and grief. That means that you, as you look around, you see injustice, and you see things that don't line up with the Word of God, and now they are piercing to you, and you deeply care about them, but just as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, look at this, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Jesus, your big brother, has his arm around you. God the Father is wrapping you up and carrying you in, and he is making you to sit on his throne with him if you overcome, like we heard this morning. The Holy Spirit is right there with you. Did you know the Holy Spirit? One of his names is the Comforter. If you are in a situation and you are mourning, you are weeping and wailing, cry out to the Comforter because just as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Blessed, happy, supremely blessed, someone who congratulations are in order for those who, number one, are poor in spirit, who realize, I don't got it. I'm not all that. I need God in my life. You're blessed. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of heaven. By faith, you can grab a hold of the kingdom and bring it in for every need of your life. And secondly, those who deeply care, those who mourn. Why? Because you will be comforted. Here and now, yes, the Holy Spirit's in your heart. He is the comforter, but also God's going to wipe away every tear from your eye. Did you get something from the word of the Lord tonight? (laughs) Hallelujah. Good. Love you guys. And want to talk to you guys about your heart and life before we leave this place. You know, we talked about blessings. Talked about living a blessed life. And none of that works without your heart being right with the Lord. Sometimes people think that their heart is right with the Lord just because they're here on the planet. Because, you know, all roads lead to heaven and 
There's no such thing as hell. Oh, show me that in the Bible, could you? Because the Bible talks about hell. Old and New Testament, Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place, and just by denying its existence doesn't make it go away. And all roads don't lead to heaven, contrary to popular belief. Why? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven. You think God created the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody mess, hung on the cross for you and I. Do you think after he did all that, that he would just say, yeah, whatever you want to do, and you want to do, and you know, this church over here this, thinks this, so I'll just, whatever you guys want to do, that's okay with me. Just do your thing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the Bible. Now, oftentimes people think, well, doesn't the Bible say good people go to church? I've been a really good person, helped out, gave money to charities, been nice to my neighbors. I'm going to get to heaven because I'm good, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere does God say just be good and that'll get you to heaven because nowhere do we see where, how good do you have to be? You know, the Bible, of course, the standard is perfection. The only one who's perfect, his name is Jesus. Not going to make it there based on your goodness. That's that spiritual poverty we were talking about. Can't go there and say, I'm rich. God, let me in. No. Got to do it his way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Not going to get there our way. Got to get there his way. Sometimes people think, well, his way's got to be going to church. I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. Uh, Pastor, I'm sitting here in church in front of you right now. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Do you know that nowhere in the Bible just say you sit in a seat in a church service, warm up a spot, and God lets you into heaven because of that? No in the Bible say be raised in church or, you know, go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes people say, well, hold on a second. I got involved at my last church. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian because I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, sang in the choir. People thought of me as a leader. Got a membership card to that church. You know that nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible say your church involvement gets you into heaven. It's not there. You say, but pastor, I know God. I know who Jesus is. I, I celebrate Easter and sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scripture to you, pastor. That's great. But have you read your Bible? Because if you had, you know that the demons know who Jesus is. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scripture, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental ascent towards God. Knowing who Jesus is in your head and yet missing him with your heart. God's always been after your heart. Jesus made the statement like this, if you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, remember we talked about the kingdom of heaven. You want to inherit the kingdom of heaven? You want to get to heaven? Here's how you do it. You must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals and movies and books and magazines and television and the internet. But let's not let the foolishness, foolishness of man define something that God defines. God has defined being born again in his word. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. We were there tonight. Book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. And occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Time out. Why do I got to do that? If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Let's get over that. Let's push past that embarrassment tonight. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. That's why we do it this way. And confess Jesus before man. I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up, I'll count it, put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are embarrassed, isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? And no one would make that trade. Come on. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. 
So tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight, come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it? Get ready to get your hand up all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe or even online. God is watching wherever you're at. And then you can click the button, respond to God next to your browser or on our homepage. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart. There's two. Anybody else real quick? Is that a hand up there in the family room? I see one up there. I think that's three. Up there. Anybody else real quick? About three wise people. Anybody else on this side? Four. Gotcha. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Who else? You're saying, ah, I know I need to do this. Come on. If that's you, just lift your hand up. Anybody else real quick? I'm going to enter into this wonderful blessing of a relationship. There's five. Who else tonight? You're saying, I know I need to. Just go for it. Come on. If that's you, just lift your hand up and let it. Let me see it. Anybody else? I'll close this up in a moment. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a hand for about five wise people tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. All five of you, or if you're number six, seven, or number eight, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do, that's your cue to get your stuff, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies here tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, come on, you can come too at this time. Let's all stand and welcome them. And you come right now. Let's welcome them. You come. Come on down. Jesus, I believe. Come on, you can come too. From the family rooms, get your kids. Jesus, come on down. I to you. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. I Jesus, I believe. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make it way to the front right now. Jesus, I belong. Right, we've got four up here. So number five, I love you. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not gonna make it just by raising your hand. You gotta give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. So I wanna encourage you, don't start these next few moments of your walk with God in rebellion, not doing what the preacher said, just because you're wondering, listen, we, we already talked about embarrassment. Listen, we all love you. No one's judging, no one's criticizing or condemning. They, they didn't, you know, get slapped on the way down here or anything like that. So if that's you, and, and, and you're really serious about raising your hand, I would encourage you just to come right now while I'm talking, okay? Just make your way to the front and, and let me talk to you guys up here. Hey guys, congratulations. This is the best decision of your life right here. You can put a smile on your face, all right? It's a good thing, okay? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you, you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, it only gets weird when Pastor Luke preaches in the mornings, all right? So... Yeah, you don't know who that is, but I'm just giving him back what he gave me this morning. But anyways, Pastor Joel's a good guy, okay? Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to do three things. He's going to, number one, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then he's going to give you a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym helps you get strong, right? Okay, f spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually, right? They're your friend in church, come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back to the old way, you go on with God's way, okay? Now let me make a promise to you guys up here, okay? Give us one year of your life here in this church, sitting under the teaching here at The Rock consistently. What does that mean? If all you can get is Sunday night, hey, every Sunday night be here. If you can get here Sunday night and Sunday morning or Saturday morning, come on, get two. Uh, maybe you can get a Wednesday night or a Friday night or something like that. And get as much of the Word of God as you can one year consistently. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. You will look at your life and say, I am so blessed. That was the word of the night, wasn't it? You will be so blessed. You'll say, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Take their word for it, all right? Turn right this way, follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer. 
of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.